was going to use this mic, but that's, that's not in the laser. Okay. I don't know if we're doing echo when we're like, yeah, yeah. yeah. so you got to. Yeah. Well, um, actually, you know, I can just, I'll turn it down here in a second when I'm done with it. Uh, good morning. I uh, hope you guys had fun last night. Um, it's nice to see you all here bright and early at uh, 11 in the morning. <laughs> yeah, it's hurting my ears too. Um, hopefully none of you guys are as bad off as Dan Kaminsky was yesterday, or maybe hopefully you guys are that bad off. Um, you guys have fun at the party last night? You guys were able to, yeah, what party? Able to make it? Um, there's some people I know that didn't show up, and I know that got a bit crowded there at some point, so some people weren't allowed to get in uh, right away, but hopefully, did, did, did you come back and were able to get in later? Um, actually, in some respects, you're probably better off, because it was like 120 degrees in there. It was just ridiculous. But hopefully the people that were roasting had a bunch of fun until things shut, got shut down. So um, right now we've got Scott Moulton coming up. He's going to be talking about uh, hacking hard drives and data recovery, and it should be a really interesting talk, so give, uh, give him a big round of applause. Can you guys hear me clearly? I'm Scott Moulton with Forensic Strategy Services, and this morning that you are here with uh, hangovers with hard drives. So uh, this morning, going through hard drives, I'm trying to break down some of the simple items that you can do to try to recover a hard drive that some of the bigger places might be doing. Because most of the time, you're not going to get a hard drive that's damaged that your grandma can afford to spend $10,000 getting your data back. Has anybody sent a hard drive off to a data recovery house before? And how much did you pay? Uh, I think it was about eight fifty, six, seven years ago. Okay. 8000 is that what you said? 850 Anybody spend more than that on a data recovery house? How much are you at? $25,000. And did you, they get the data back? Yeah. Okay, that's great. But your grandma's not going to pay that, is she? <coughs> so, my presentation is all done in Flash, so it's all animated. You guys can see this presentation on myharddrivedied.com. So if you want to go there and look at it, <laughs> myharddrivedied.com is where it's at. <clears throat> I'm going to go through some basics here of some of the things that I found out going through breaking hard drives down. I've done about seven to 800 hard drives by this time of just doing repairs. When I started this business, it was, uh, it was primarily a spinoff from my forensics business because it's pretty much the same idea. We're using some high-end software, some other items to try to do a data recovery that you just might not be able to do any other way but I've started finding some cheaper, easier ways to do things that I could tell people so that they could try on their own. One of the big things on this slide that I'm gonna talk about that I don't have an animation of later is this actuator lock right here, this little, this little piece of plastic that sticks off of the drive. When the drive starts to spin up, it creates some air pressure, and the air bearing actually causes this piece to just teeter out of the way. There's no mechanics involved in it. It just basically teeters out of the way, and it unlocks the actuator arm so that the head can actually move. So that's your locking mechanism for the hard drive these days. The downside to doing some of the data recovery, some of the new hard drives have almost kind of like a little cap on the top of the drive. And when you take the top of the platters, the, the, where the platters, you can actually see the platters. At this point in time, if you were to power up the drive, that actuator lock might not actually flip out of the way. There's not enough air pressure. So sometimes you either have to do it manually or do some other things in the process. And I'm going to show that as we go through this. The, uh, the other thing that I'm going to point out too is the spindle right here, the spindle cover. If you have platters and they're mounted on the spindle cover, when you take those screws off and you remove the top little piece that holds that, that metal piece right here, those platters, if there's two platters or three platters, they'll spin independently. And once that happens, you can never recover your drive again. So this is part of the problem with trying to do like a motor replacement or something like that because the motor actually is right underneath this cap. When you pull that off, it's part, you'll actually see the wires that are wrapped around the magnetic mechanisms and things like that. So it's extremely difficult on a multi-platter system to pull the, the actual motor out and do a replacement. In a lot of cases, the motor is actually mounted to the casing of the drive, so you just can't pull it out and remove it. So those are two of the main things that aren't covered in the rest of the animations, but you need to be cautious about or keep in mind, and I'll cover something when we hit the end. I, I break this down into two segments. The first part is going to be going through the basics of a hard drive and what the things are that I see that are different that you might not already know. 
and the second part is going to be going through the hard drives that I've done recoveries for and trying to repair them and when you know it's going to be good and when it's going to be bad and when you can move on. The, uh, on the bottom on the board, the board itself is unique to the drive. When the manufacturer produces the drive, they make the board to go with that drive at that time. So there is firmware that's on this board that matches some other information that's on the hard drive. And it's changed over time, so it's kind of hard to order which one's going to be important first. So I'll go into this part, and then I'll get into the servo information. But on the board itself, it matches some information that's on the platter. And they switched mechanisms for how the head moves across the platter. And they had to write information on the board. So the board, when you're looking for a drive that you want to try to match for a recovery, you have to get the date as close to the date of the original manufacturer of this drive as possible. And typically I see when we get outside of a two week time period that you can't do a recovery because the firmware has changed or something else has changed on the board. So the idea here is, is that if you were going to repair your own hard drive and you wanted to find uh, another drive so that you could replace this board, you have to try to find the model number and the date as close as possible to within two weeks is my, my preferred method of finding a drive, because you're going to be calling eBay and doing whatever you can to try to get this board. So they basically change from chip to chip, and the manufacturer might have two drives that are made in two different locations at the same time. So in Korea, you might have one drive being made, and in uh, China, another drive might be made. And they may have identical components other than that, but you'll see like on this particular hard drive, it's identical, it's an IBM hard drive, but the boards are different. So the firmware has changed, which means there's something else about the drive that's changed as well. So you've got to hunt down these exact boards in order to replace them, or you won't be able to do anything to repair that drive. Every hard drive that you guys have right now in any of your laptops actually currently already has errors going on on a continual basis. Errors are so common at this point in time on the hard drives that they are not even trying to just make a, a complete hard drive that doesn't have errors on it. They are trying to do everything they can to fix those errors on the fly. So there are ECC items on the board that try to do error correction while the drive is running and reading that data. So if it gets an error and it can repair it on the fly in the board by doing some error correcting code, then it doesn't even mark that as an error. It doesn't show that as a bad block, and it's going to keep on going. And it's just going to say, okay, fine, I figured out what that bit is, and I'm going to fix it. If it has enough retries on that particular block, it can't get enough data from it, it can't do a repair in the ECC, then it will say, oh, I've retried, and it's different from manufacturer to manufacturer, from drive to drive, how many times it's going to retry before it actually puts a bad block on the board. It's going to say, oh, this block is bad. I'm not going to use this block anymore. I'm not going to try. But before that, it knows there's an error, but it's not going to mark it as bad. And if that block gets erased and later on gets written again and it's OK, it never even notices it doesn't do anything with it. So not every block that has an error is going to already show up as an error and going to get marked bad. And that's part of this SMART mechanism, too. You hear about SMART, and it's basically monitoring, and it's trying to figure out how many errors something's having. It's trying to do a predictability so that it can try to tell you, oh, my drive has you know, 700 bad sectors on it, and you need to get a new drive so that you're not going to keep going on. <clears throat> so we're going to break the hard drive down into its parts now. Now, one of the other things that I run into all the time that people say is a drive is hermetically sealed. You just can't open the case and work on a drive and do those kind of things. And a drive is not hermetically sealed. 